No matter what your job is, it's only a matter of time before some cutting edge AI enabled sensor laden superhuman robot goes ahead and steals it. That time is probably fairly far in the future since today's robots can't seem to stop swerving into cop cars, forgetting how many fingers are on the human hand and occasionally breaking said fingers. But did you know that there are tasks that robots actually do properly? Did you know almost every piece of electronics on the planet is assembled by a robot and has been for over 40 years? Allow me to introduce Magnus the Pick and Place, a robotic circuit board assembler that can install 16,000 components per hour. Along with his little brother Marvin, Magnus has assembled almost every PCB in this overflowing warehouse, over 400 different designs in all. This pair does the job so well, four technicians can crank out over a thousand items every single day and still have enough time to bike home for dinner. So Magnus, how's the job treating you? What's that thing on your face? You look like a huge douchebag. Very nice. Today you'll discover the hybrid offspring of 3D printers and vacuum cleaners that are heavier than cars and 10 times the price. The robotic army that silently and tirelessly transforms coils of components into every circuit board you will ever power up. Ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs, prepare for a peek into the powerful, precise, and preposterously productive pick and place. My name is Zach Friedman, and welcome to Void Star Live. Lab. But I lied, we are not at Void Star Lab. We've barged into Sparkfun Electronics in Niwot, Colorado, one of the best names in DIY technology and the sponsor of this video. If you've ever seen a janky circuit project like the ones on my channel or this automatic safe cracker I'm totally not gonna borrow for crime purposes, you've probably seen an iconic red Sparkfun board. They've designed hundreds of microcontrollers, tinkers, tools, sensors, and more, and they all have detailed documentation and ready to use libraries to help you get cracking so you're not just spinning your wheels. I've been using SparkFun products for almost a decade, and no matter what crazy project you're making, they probably have something that'll carve weeks off the process. And if you're not working on a project, all that wild hardware is guaranteed to inspire one. Also, the most famous wall in hardware hacking is only an hour from Void Star Lab. That's definitely not why I need a safe cracker. SparkFun actually manufactures every board with their fiery logo over half of their 757 products right here in Colorado. These literal robot overlords let me wander through their R&D lab, warehouse, and factory floor to show you the behind the scenes bots that literally have built their business. Just to be clear, SparkFun does not fabricate the boards themselves. If you watch that PCB video, which I've linked up here in the corner, you'll know that fabricating circuit boards is a messy process that needs literal tons of heavy machinery and oodles of toxic chemicals. It almost always makes more sense to buy circuit boards from a dedicated fab house, even if you have all the equipment to assemble them. Even that isn't totally accurate. You don't buy boards you buy panels of boards. Almost all SparkFun circuits arrive in 5x7 fiberglass panels packed with as many of a single product as possible. Since I am very smart, I normally use the metric system, but for legacy reasons, circuitry still uses imperial units. Enjoy the victory, my loyal viewers of Liberia and Myanmar. If you look at the panel, you'll notice the individual boards are scored, but they're not separated, and they aren't packed all the way to the edge. They're intentionally surrounded by margins about half an inch wide, which are strewn with these weird looking tiny bullseyes. These so-called rails and fiducials are the infrastructure that enables these machines to install hundreds of parts per minute. And to understand how, we need to take a step back and learn how to solder. Don't you dare touch that skip button. This section is 30 seconds long. First, grab a component and put it on the circuit board. Heat up the pins on the part and pads on the board. Feed a mix of flux and solder onto the hot joint. Boiling flux cleans and protects the metal while the molten solder flows into every nook and cranny. Surface mount soldering is similar, but since we have to hold the part down with one hand, flux and solder have to be separate steps. Place the part, flux it up, get it hot, melt some metal, done. The solder serves double duty to splice the part into the circuit and acolyte glue to mechanically connect it to the board. Soldering with an iron is cheap and easy, but mounting each component one by one is just too slow for any kind of mass production. The solution is to ditch solid solder altogether and use a solder paste. This is a super fine metal powder suspended in a goopy gel, and I'm gonna use this handheld dispenser to dispense handheldedly a dollop on each pad. The sticky paste holds the parts in position, so instead of touching each joint with an iron, I can use a hot air gun to simultaneously 
simultaneously solder the entire, you know, general vicinity. Because parts are floating free, surface tension can drag misaligned components back into the perfect position. That's exactly what's going on in SparkFun's production line, except bigger and beefier. First, a technician grabs the corresponding stencil and loads it into Crushinator the stencil printer. He adds a baseball-sized glob of solder paste fresh out the fridge. They store it in the fridge to keep the tiny beads of solder from falling out of suspension. They insert a panel, and a computer vision system uses those little bullseyes called fiducials to precisely align the circuit and the stencil. The crushinator squeegees on some solder paste, wipes away the excess, and ding! Out comes a pasted up panel with a perfect dab on every pad. The crushinator does not actually have a dinger to ding. Dang. Magnus the pick and place is next. A technician loads components into his feeding mechanisms and clinches the pasted up boards into brackets. Mechanisms were parts shuffle in and a few minutes later, every part on every panel is perfectly positioned. We'll get to the specifics in a sec. This is still the pick and place episode, but I'll tell you now, Magnus also doesn't ding when the job is done. The technician transfers the populated boards to Trogdor the infrared reflow oven and a conveyor belt conveys them through five separate temperature zones. This activates the flux, melts the solder, and then gently cools the board back down. Trogdor's final zone is critical because if the board stays too hot for too long, it'll start burninating the circuit board, burninating components. Exactly seven minutes after insertion, fully soldered panels drop from Trogdor's derriere, ready to be tested, broken up, and shipped out to nerds. There still isn't a dingus to ding. What the hell is wrong with these people? SparkFun's production line is really doing the same thing as my benchtop tools, but with one critical difference. I have to build one board at a time, one part at a time, but the big boys crank out multiple panels at once. That's the magic of mass production. These machines make batches of boards take a fixed amount of time. The squeegee always squeegees a 5 by 7 inch panel, no matter what is on it. The oven is always 7 minutes long, no matter what it's soft. Final testing and packaging is done on an entire panel at once. Once the job is set up, running another batch of boards should only take a few extra seconds. But I say should because there is a plot hole. Assembly doesn't scale at all. Even the highest speed, lowest drag production line has to painstakingly pull every component out of its packaging and drop it into position on the circuit board one by one. You can't spread electronics like frosting, at least not yet. Each production run can make dozens of panels, each panel can hold dozens of boards, and each board can have dozens of parts. But none of that matters unless they're rolling off the line faster than the orders are rolling in, and the limiting factor is placing the components. The faster we can pick up parts and place them down, the more advanced we can make our most advanced inventions, the cheaper we can make our cheapest goods, and the easier it is for a small business like SparkFun to manufacture and stock hundreds of different products. Assembly is the bottleneck, the hotgates, the T-Rex dinosaur, the linchpin that for all intense purposes and intensive purposes determines what you gentle viewer are allowed to do with electronics. The very viability of technology itself hinges on how many milliseconds it takes to physically put a chip in its forever home. Of course, sheer speed isn't enough, right? Like parts can't get stuck in their packaging. They can't get fumbled along the way. They have to land dead center first shot. Those parts have to be picked up very predictably and placed very carefully, or technicians will have to manually fix defects and burn precious time. Today we're following these quick scale boards, which are an interface for load cells. These are sensors that let you weigh stuff and measure how things behave under load. With 14 surface mount devices and a single through hole component, this is one of SparkFun's simpler products. Yet if they took only a single second to grab and install each part, this run would need days to finish. Thousands of times an hour, Magnus the pick and place installs a part within thousands of an inch, grabs another within thousandths of a second, and repeats this thousands of of hours a year, and not once does that poor bastard get to go ding. To get enough speed and precision for mass production, every single part has to be optimized. Even the packaging is part of the process. Every time you handle a component, you risk dropping it, crushing it, blowing it apart with static electricity, spilling coffee on it, and or sending it flying into said coffee. Was my frappuccino supposed to have sprinkles? And were the sprinkles supposed to be this crunchy? Such is the life of a surface mount device. It's up to the packaging to make sure every spicy sprinkle makes it safe and sound in the same orientation and unlikely to fly into outer space when Magnus unpacks and grabs it. Or should I say when he grabs four? 
per second. Sparkfun stockpiles thousands of parts in their warehouse, and this packaging is the only thing keeping them safe, tidy, and most importantly, easy for the pick and place to pick up and, uh, What's, what's the word? Most components arrive on special tape wound onto a standardized reel. Note the individual components, the anti-static plastic, protective film, and the regularly spaced sprocket holes. Every part of this is tuned specifically to make automated placement faster and more reliable. Before starting the run, a technician reviews the bill of materials and loads each part's tape reel into its own feeder. Sometimes they load multiple reels of the same component. You'll see why in a sec. He snaps up to 16 feeders into a magazine and loads the magazine into one of Magnus's feeder bays. Sprockets engage those film strip style holes and draw components in. Pay attention to the clear film. It stops just short of the holes so a set of rubber rollers can peel off just enough to expose a single part. The spacing between the components has already been programmed, so Magnus knows exactly how far to advance the tape to present a new part for pickup. Each reel holds around 2,000 parts, each magazine can hold up to 16 reels, and this machine holds up to 11 staggered magazines, which I am now calling stagazines. But before you start running mental math, remember, not every reel fits in a stagazine. Take the cell baseband module. The whole circuit board arrives in this gigantic, super wide tape, and that calls for more real estate, because it's on a reel! Since Sparkfun uses a ton of different parts, big and small, they have bins of off-size feeders that slot into modular magazines. Of course, you can't get every part in tape and reel. Chunky chips and connectors come in custom-fit tube magazines, and high-end silicon often arrives in matrix trays. Sometimes you just get a big ol' sack of loose parts and it's up to you to figure it out. Some chips arrive as bare silicon dyes, not even coated in black epoxy, and the feeder has to carefully turn them over and glue them down. Sparkfun installs the bulk parts by hand and doesn't use those flip chips at all, but they do have specialized feeding systems for reels, tubes, and trays. Feeding parts from a tube is a lot like soothing a crying baby. You just shake the hell out of it until the problem goes away. As the vibrator vibrates, inertia ejects one chip at a time for the pickup head to pick up. Because tubes hold fewer parts than reels, the technician has to load four identical tubes at once. They just replace each one as it runs out to keep the process rolling. As for the trays, they don't work with any feeding mechanism. Instead, a worker mounts them to the carriage right next to the circuit board itself, and it's up to Magnus to find and grab each chip one by one. Speaking of the board, this carriage is the only part of this multi-ton monstrosity that ever touches a circuit board. The other 11 twelfths do literally nothing but feed components. There aren't any fancy vices, jigs, or clamps to lock in the panels, just little magnetic clips on a steel tray. The exact positioning isn't important. Just like the stencil machine, the pick and place uses a tool-mounted camera to scan the board and calibrate itself against those fiducials. Fun fact, these little targets are why circuit boards glow in the dark. I think we might have talked about this in the circuit board video, nope. but the computer vision system has a much easier time picking out a glowing ring than just a white ring. Fiducials don't just help the system find its center and realign its chi. They also compensate for warping and thermal expansion. There's no time for manual intervention. It's up to Magnus to account for everything. The board is locked, the parts are loaded, the solder paste is moist. It's time for the hard part, transferring each part from package to PCB. The industry standard solution is a good suck. A pneumatic pickup whizzes over and drops a needle-like head onto the component, pressing a tiny suction cup against the part's flat surface. A vacuum pump engages said suck, air pressure mashes silicon into silicone, the pickup snaps back, and the part is yanked out. The pickup whips back to the PCB, drops the head, and mashes the part into position. The pickup shuts off the vacuum to release the part, and then reverses thrust. Solder paste and other contaminants can sometimes prevent the part from shaking loose. Loose, and that little puff of air dislodges any residual shenanigans. There's no wasted time. While that previous part was riding the suck nozzle express, the feeder was already advancing the tape or jiggling the tube to tee up the next component. All surface mount parts need a sufficiently suckable surface. Headers and other things with holes have to ship with stickers or detachable clips for the nozzle to grab onto. These are removed after soldering, and Sparkfun has collected a lot of them. 
The whole motion is unbelievably fast. The pickup is propelled back and forth by a high acceleration linear motor with colossal magnets. It's capable of zipping between the furthest component and the furthest panel in like 100 milliseconds. This is so fast, if its brakes fail, the carriage can crash right through the machine steel chassis. The X-Rail actually curves inward, so the makeshift coil gun slug will punch a hole in the inventory instead of Crushinator, Trogdor, or you know, the operator weak human flesh. This machine has what's called a split axis configuration. The vacuum pickup and its snappy raise lower mechanism ride on a ludicrous fast gantry that only travels left and right. The workpiece PCB is clamped to the Y carriage, which only moves a couple feet in and out. This configuration means the Y axis doesn't have to schlep the X axis and the Z axis only schleps a tiny vacuum nipple. This minimizes the amount of that pesky inertia to slow things down. After all, inertia is a property of matter. But Magnus and Marvin, like all pick and places, are packing a fourth axis, theta, or rotation. Your board might have a chip pointing at 6 o'clock, but the tape has it at 9 o'clock. Damn those chip makers, shipping chips in different orientations than my projects. As the pickup carries a component to the circuit board, the suction cup can turn in place, spinning the part right round, right round before it goes down, down. The theta axis also straightens out components that arrive crooked, and as wacky as this sounds, this right here is the most sophisticated and difficult part of the entire system. Like we saw earlier, parts fit loosely in their tape tubes and trays. The wiggle room increases the odds of a clean, friction-free extraction. But this also lets parts shift during transit, and the system needs to return the part to a known position. As the part barrels towards the PCB, it passes over a one-dimensional line camera that captures a snapshot like an old-school document scanner. This is only like two inches from the panel, so Magnus has milliseconds to interpret the image, compensate for the rotation, reverse any offsets, and, well, this is where the most common problems happen. Sloppy molding, contaminants, and even cluttered chip markings can screw with the computer vision and botch the landing. I saw a worn out nozzle cause some minor catastrophes by simply allowing the part to shift a little in the two inches between camera and board. I just happened to be shooting the carriage as the pileup happened. I didn't sabotage spark fun this time. Theoretically, my little robo bro can pick and place 16,000 parts per hour, but actually hitting that number is harder than it sounds. To get this board done on schedule, the feeding, pickup, positioning, adjustment, and placement all need to run simultaneously at top speed, but even that isn't really enough. Remember, every second spent grabbing a part from the feeder or trundling back to the board is another second not spent climbing spark fun's on-site rock wall. Higher numbers just aren't enough, plus we're already expecting epoxy-coated metal-studded light rocks held in place by air pressure alone to withstand multiple G's without shifting one mil. This metaphorical stone has lost so much blood, it's in hypovolemic shock. If we can't move faster, we have to move fewer times by grabbing more parts at once. The original solution was called a chip shooter, literally just get more vacuum heads into the pick and place. Some of these used a spinning turret, a revolver cylinder, or even just like a minigun style chain. So fleeing around those bulky tools did slash accuracy, but it accelerated the process so aggressively, pick and place machines could almost immediately obliterate manual circuit board assemblers. The job title, not the technicians themselves, all in due time. It's a moot point, because chip shooters are obsolete. It's all because you entitled consumer brats insist that every gadget has to be a millimeter thinner every 12 months. To make each year's plumbus marketably schmaxier, chips now have such tiny pins and are so closely packed, even three thousandths of an inch off center can ruin a board. Easy solution reduce weight by stacking multiple heads on the same pickup, and use complicated hydraulics to run them all off one vacuum pump. That's what's going on in Magnus's special Hydra pickup. Eight pencil-thin heads move in tandem, shifting back and forth like a harmonica to collect and carry components concurrently. It picks up eight similarly sized parts one by one, returns to the board, and deposits them. If the stars align, Magnus can even drop all eight heads simultaneously to grab eight parts from eight tapes. The Hydra can even swap mid-run between carriage-mounted nozzle cassettes to handle three common sizes of components, but even that's not enough. 
SparkFun makes hundreds of products, and this machine has to handle thousands of components. Most of them are the tiny capacitors, resistors, and LEDs that are approximately the same size, and the Hydro can handle all of them. But some components can't be small, right? A USB port has to fit a USB cable. Some of them are just enormous, like an entire Raspberry Pi Pico. SparkFun could just mount a variety of nozzles on the Hydra, but that would sacrifice the ability to grab similar parts in bulk. Magnus actually splits the difference. Hidden behind the Hydra is MIDOS, a modular tool changer head that can dynamically swap between six specially shaped nozzles mounted to the carriage. The Hydra handles LEDs, resistors, capacitors, and other small parts. These are roughly the same size and mass, so they can use the same pickups. The MIDOS, which of course has to waste time swapping nozzles, only comes into play for the heaviest, clunkiest, and most delicate components. Usually this is fast enough for spark fun, but some super dense or super popular products need even more time carved off the process. The penultimate thing to optimize, that means second last, is the path itself. This is basically a traveling salesman problem, the classic CS101 algorithm challenge of visiting a number of points as quickly as possible. Technically optimizing a pick and place toolpath is even more complicated since you're dealing with round trips, nozzle compatibility, where the parts are loaded, where the boards are mounted, etc. Usually it's not worth the trouble and the machine itself does a little bit of light optimization on its own. The real time saving secret ingredient is something you might have actually seen yourself. If you've ever designed a board in EagleCAD and used SparkFun's very popular parts libraries, you may have noticed that every item has a mysterious five digit ID number in its attribute section. It looks like one of SparkFun's product numbers, but many of them never appear on SparkFun's site. Well, SparkFun's web store and their internal inventory actually call on the same database. So what you're seeing is their internal parts tracking system. To set up a new product, the engineers send the technician the item's EagleCAD design files. A stack of custom scripts convert this into a list of which part needs to go where in which orientation. This also cross-references a database of tooling, so the pick-and-place machine knows what kind of feeder to look for, what footprint to expect, which pickup head to use, and how far to advance the tape or jiggle the reel to expose the next component. This process engineering carves hours off pre-production, and remember, Spark SparkFun sells tons of different products, so this pays dividends dozens and dozens of times a week. It just goes to show, technical improvement doesn't always come from improved technology. Magnus pile drives the last part, secures the pickup head, and presents his hard work to the technician. The tech carefully unmounts the panels, slides them into Trogdor's fire-belching maw, and faffs around for precisely seven minutes. The completed panels fall onto a cooling rack, and the production run is coming to an end. If the board had components on the other side, it would go back through the stencil printer, the pick and place, and the infrared oven just upside down. The quick scale board only has one component side, so Magnus gets the rest of the day off. Manual assemblers manually install a through hole terminal block, and Simmons, the KISS selective soldering machine, sprays the undercarriage with a computer controlled jet of liquid metal. The end product is 55 panels of 16 quick compatible load cell front ends. Each board features resistors and caps from reels, a chip from a tube, connectors in bulk, and more all hustling from parts inventory to sales inventory in minutes. The other smaller line was running off some kind of cellular data device, so by the end of the day, these four technicians and six bots have manufactured over 1,500 products. SparkFun depanelizes the boards, a fancy way to say snaps them apart, and applies the finishing touches. Some products need firmware burned, components calibrated, LEDs color corrected, etc., so these make pit stops on a huge variety of different semi auto automated test jigs, none of which go ding. Each board gets heat sealed into a plastic anti-static baggie and tagged with an inventory sticker, awaiting that glorious day when it's stuffed into a red cardboard shipping box so a hairy nerd can make a janky gimmick project that mildly amuses internet strangers for 22 minutes. But SparkFun actually has one more pick and place machine in their R&D lab, and I've been using it to illustrate the mechanisms safely locked behind Magnus's protective glass. This open frame model is much slower than Marvin or Magnus. It's far less precise and it holds fewer parts, but it does cost 99% less. This guy isn't used very often since you need to make a certain number of boards before setting up the pick and place job it takes less time than just 
doing it by hand. But sometimes speed isn't a priority, multitasking is. These types of open frame pick and places are actually fairly affordable, and there are even a few open source models, so if you find yourself regularly installing a ton of components, you might want to pawn your job off on a robot. I hope you learned something interesting about the incredibly impressive technology that literally makes the modern world. If you like this episode, hit subscribe for more technical esoterica or texoterica every couple weeks. I'd like to extend my thanks to SparkFun Electronics for sponsoring this episode and letting me run amok in their Colorado HQ. If you're looking for a load cell front end to call your own, check the description. And if you're not, I've linked some of my personal favorite SparkFun products to tempt you instead. None of these are affiliate links, I just want to help SparkFun out. Of course, thanks to Magnus the Pick and Place and Casey the Pick and Place Technician for sharing their expertise and not fermenting my corpse into motor oil to grease the robot uprising, right? Right? The good news! We have a cadre of extremely generous patrons that enable us to venture into the field in search of more deep tech dives. The bad news, I have to thank people with silly names, like lab scientist Henry Bitt, the web machine, and disestablishmentarianism. Damn patron names obscuring my luscious beard. Our hypnotic, robotic, and mildly erotic collaborators include The Suits Ruined Our Fun, Creality Online Store, Command, Caster the Catboy, What the Chuck, Schleppy the Schwagster, Alan Reiner, Ooze System Works, and Modern Idiotism. I hid their names in this video, let me know if you find them. I may have also left my Easter or egg behind at SparkFun's headquarters. If you're an employee, let me know if you find them. I was going to do a gag where a pick and place machine would like read off the lab assistant supporters, but I realized I would make this a very strange video to listen to. Besides, I know you love hearing me struggle to say things like, I give money to Zach so he tells my wife I love her, period clots, Eddie, Clifton Henning, Cameron Swords, my dog is a bear, Brad Cox, Thomas B. Myers, Vicarious Nerdgasms, Kevin DeGraff, Ghost of Brad Stormer, Little Bobby Tables, Burn Doc 3, Danny DeVoy of life, Ryan Guler, Scroto Sagans, Vigeli, Bob Dobbington, Dimitri Lair, Ama the Great, Kyle Fisher, One Handful of Beans, Storm B Design, Michael Scratchfinger, Roger Pigum of the Great Star Theater, Joshua Godovin, Bum Tickly 69, Zanforian, Good Lady Nat, Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars, Trans Rights, What Appears to Be a Thin Strip of Zebra, Rusty Flute, Bill Schooler, Dempsers, Brian Cofford, Varka, Danny McGee, Babington Q, Stabsworth the Fourth, Meow! Isakai Elf, Mahiro Chan, Desi, nah. Quantumly Tangled, SXP, Nathan Johnson, Michael Roche. I inspired the Next Layer's YouTube channel, so you guys should check it out. It's true, he's got some good Gridfinity videos. Onyx Plague, Good Suck, The Cuttlefish, Iron Rain, Kink Shaming Warless, Protagonist, Boulder Creek Air, James, Birds Aren't Real, Wake Up, Sheeple, Granville Schmidt, Ashley Coleman, Lydia Kay, Azundo, Wielder of Iron, Heater of Shrink, Dax Earl, Sunburnt Cat, A Very Fine Dumpster Fire, Mark Zism, Steven, Six Foot, Six Figure, Six Pack, Schulte. Oral Netta, Trump did nothing wrong, Samuel Roos, Pussy Nugget, The Antifa, The Benevolent Misanthrope, Burn It, Powerful CCH, this guy, whose name I refuse to pronounce, Cats, Quantum Foam, Max Lux, says I'll teach you Epson, Call Sign Carrot, Talon Democratic Socialist, and a pretty righteous dude, Acorn, Get Lie and Hike It, and Cullen J. Webb, Will You Please Marry Me and Make Me the Happiest Cyborg Half Alive. Oh my god, someone just proposed in my patron role. Brooke, get the champagne, they're in love! Thanks for watching, and sorry for delaying your engagement by a month. <laughs> may all your dreams come true, and may they all go ding. I'll see you in the future.